Alzheimer Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, and I'm so excited that you're joining us today. We are going to have a fascinating conversation as usual as we learn from people all around the world at all ages and stages of life. Stay tuned as we shift our dementia care from crisis to comfort. Here we go. What you think about Well, hi, everyone, and welcome back to Alzheimer Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, and I'm thrilled you could be with us today. If you enjoyed our opening music, it's called Clarion Call by the Mark Arneson Band, and feel free to download that on any of your favorite music platforms. For those of you that are new to our show, Alzheimer's Speaks is about sound information, not just sound bites. My own mom lived with the disease, and I get it. I totally understand. We need to hear from people in the trenches at all stages and all levels all around the world. So if you have a story to share, please reach out to me. Maybe you have a product, a service, a tool, you've written a book, have videos, or have made a film. Um, maybe you're working on a research project, or you think there's a research project that needs to be done. Give me a holler, and we will schedule you as a guest. Because again, everyone is welcome here on Alzheimer Speaks Radio. Now, before I introduce our guests, I always like to do a couple of shout outs. So the first one I want to do is to a new Alzheimer's disease research project called Picnic Health. And you can go to picnichealth.com forward slash speaks and sign up. And actually, you'll get $25 just for doing that. What Picnic Health does is they collect and they digitize all of your medical records into one online account, and then you can consent to share that anonymized data with your medical records, with medical researchers, and then they will be able to examine real world data from medical records. And researchers can find answers from that that couldn't be found in clinical trials. Know that there's important information in each one of our unique healthcare journeys. So feel free to share your journey. And if you are caring for someone with Alzheimer's disease, you can sign up on their behalf as well, as long as you are legally able to do that and manage their medical records on a Picnic Health account as well. Again, that address is picnichealth.com forward slash speaks. Let's see, we're still living with COVID, lots of stuff going on. So I wanna give you a couple of educational supports that you can tap into. One is the Arthur's Memory Cafe, sponsored by Arthur's Senior Care. We get together virtually the second and the fourth Wednesday of each month at one o'clock central time. Anyone around the world is welcome to join us, as well as Brookdale North is sponsoring a Caregiver Connect. We typically meet in person on the last Wednesday of the month, But in December, we decided to go virtual. We'll see what happens here a little later on in January. So if you're in Minnesota, that is from 10 to 11 o'clock, the last Wednesday of the month. For that one, you can call 763-913-6141 and sign up. For the Arthur's Memory Cafe, just reach out to me at radio at alzheimerspeaks.com and I will get you that information. Also, Artist Senior Living is doing two educational programs, which I'm thrilled to be involved with. One is going to be January 11th, and that is from 6 to 7 p.m., and that is for families, and it's called the Caregiver Survival Camp. We're going to be talking about the realities of dementia and giving you family-friendly tips and tools. Again, totally free. You can sign up and register at 240-293. 0155. And then on January 13th from 530 to 7, I will be doing an educational program for professionals. And that is tools for dementia professionals understanding and supporting the families we serve. And for that one, you can register at 240-293-0244. Or again, you can always reach out to me at 
radio at alzheimerspeaks.com. We're going to hear from the foot bar walker, and we'll be right back. I'm Peggy from Danville, Kentucky, and I'm 91 years old. The foot bar walker revolutionized my care of George. It absolutely benefits the patient and the caregiver both, and that's the beauty of it. It's so easy to use. It folds up just like a dream. I got it in and out of the car without any effort at all. The saving that I made from having to put him in a nursing home came to about $192,000. The foot bar walker was designed not only to assist the patient, but also the caregiver. It's like having a portable pull bar everywhere you go. Patients have more control of their motion and pain management, and no lifting from the caregiver is required. Caregivers, put your foot down and quit hurting your own health. No matter which side of the foot bar walker you're on, it's a win-win. Call 731-924-4444 and visit our factory showroom in Paris, Tennessee, or visit us online at thefootbarwalker.com. Well, I am really excited to introduce our guest today. We are going to be talking with Ileana Kadushin, and she is a professional musician and storyteller and the executive director and founder of Stories Love Music, which is a 501c3. And for those of you that don't know what that is, that means nonprofit. So feel free to pull your checkbooks out because this is a great opportunity to su support their wonderful work. Um, they provide free creative engagement programs of music and storytelling to caregivers who care for seniors with dementia. She also is a co-host for a podcast called No, I Know. And that is where she and her husband, James Harrell, who is a co-host, interview people who make a difference in communities with music performances too. So welcome, Ileana. I'm so thrilled to have you with us today. Thank you so much, Lori. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I'm excited. Your, your program sounds really interesting. Free is always exciting because people are so stretched, not only in terms of needing to be connected and getting tools, but financially these days. So, you know, you're giving us a double whammy there in terms of, of help and support. So thank you so much for that. Now, before we get started, I always like to ask my guests if they have been personally touched by dementia themselves in their family or circle of friends. You know, Lori, I guess my answer to that would be um, really that it was about being affected as a musician. Um, I can recall being in New York City and attending a conference of um, musicians and music therapists and neuroscientists and really hearing from so many different people and angles about the power of music. And as a musician sitting in the audience, I was really moved, very moved by that. Um, I had been a musician for audiences, just regular audiences and general audiences and knew the effect that the perform music performances had. And the idea that this could be such a powerful, have such a powerful impact in this arena that's what moved me. That's what resonated with me and brought me into this world. Wonderful. And, and music is so powerful. And it's finally, I think people are finally understanding the importance of it. I think it's one of those things that for so long, we've just taken it for granted in our life, but we haven't really processed the importance of it and what it does to our, to our being physically, emotionally, spiritually. Um, and yet we've all cried to a song in the car or we've laughed because it's, it's brought back some great memories. Um, but again, we've always just kind of taken that as part of life. And I love that there's more research being done and that people are learning to embrace something that is readily available to us to be able to help them on their their journey of life as well as as uh, caring for another why don't you tell us about how stories love music got started absolutely well i i would have to begin by bringing you to 2012 when hurricane sandy hit uh, the United States and hit the East Coast very hard and had decimated some senior facilities in the Rockaways, had knocked out power and water. So hundreds of seniors were set up in temporary shelters. And my husband James and I were living in Brooklyn at the time and were asked, like many musicians were asked, to come into a shelter 
and play some music, play concerts, tell stories, provide some joy, some levity, some engagement. Walked in to an old YMCA in Brooklyn that had a huge indoor track, massive, all these cots set up with these fluorescent lights overhead that never got turned off. And as a human, I had a light bulb moment that said, wow, we're, we have a, we're gonna have a lot of elderly um, statistic percentage wise in this country who are going to have both physical, emotional, mental, psychological issues. Who's going to take care of all these um, people and how are they going to stay vital? How are they going to age with vitality? That was sort of the first. As we're at this concert at the shelter, my husband and I are singing one of our songs, one of our original songs called The Joy of Life. And as we finish performing this song, a woman that has been in the shelter for a couple of weeks, probably in her 70s, blind, um, sort of waves her hand and says, can I get up and speak to, to everyone? We said, absolutely. So she stood up in front of us, the musicians and the rest of the people listening and said, when you sang that, I felt though I was scared and the storm made me feel scared and I wasn't certain what the future was going to hold. You made me feel like I could find joy mm -hmm. in my every day. And that was the next sort of illumination for me as a musician and as a human that music could allow people to feel engaged, to feel seen, to feel heard. And that that was a beginning to something. Uh, aging with dignity to dealing with whatever health crisis was there. So that was really the beginning of doing, which led us to do field work, uh, going to memory, um, memory units, memory care units, hospitals, Alzheimer's units. Uh, my husband and I, and as musicians, went in and did a lot of field work, about five years, uh, then led us to create the nonprofit Stories Love Music in 2017, and then very much having to ask the question, how can I affect the greatest change if I'm one person, one human, one musician? Who's spending the most time with seniors and seniors with memory impairment? Ah, the caregivers. Perhaps I need to take all my focus if I really Stories Love Music's mission is to improve the care and support for those with dementia and Alzheimer's, to um, provide self-care and stress management for those caregivers for them by exploring this connection between music storytelling and emotional health, helping caregivers manage their reactive emotions, the reactive emotions of those they're caring for. But this creative engagement, it has to be People have to have time to learn what that is and how to use it. So once we pivoted to that, ah, we have to create a program for free that teaches caregivers how to use this power of music and storytelling with themselves and those they care for. Wonderful. Well, would it be okay if I play just a snippet of your song, uh, Joy of Life, for our audience? I would be delighted. It's not by chance that you're with us here today The universe expanded, giving you the way To say Okay The joy of life is here with you today That really had like a super dreamy, um, comfortable feeling, almost like what reminded me of one of the Beatles song where I'm just kind of floating in that dream safe state. So very beautiful. Well, I love that. Thank you. We've, we've heard that sometimes um, being compared to across the universe and having this very vast, um, large, dreamy, comfortable, uplifting and it really is an important uh, message. Um, the joy of life is here with you today. And in a sense, the creative engagement that we um, give caregivers the time to define 
and figure out both for themselves, creatively engaging themselves and the people they care for. In a sense, creative engagement brings us joy of life. Think about those moments in your life when you've been creatively engaged, mm -hmm. whether you were doing cooking or a crafting project or you were watching a, a dance performance or a really wonderful film um, or you were painting your creative engagement with yourself, you were being engaged maybe by someone or with yourself, that can bring us into the moment with a sense of joy, which, you know, right now in the world when people are having so much discomfort, stress, um, pain, anxiety, depression, um, we really cannot undervalue, um, you, we really have to value uh, this creative engagement. Um, and that's why we focus on it in our program so much. Well, I totally agree with you. It, it is, um, we need that sense of calm. We need that sense of relief. Um, Cause boy, spinning in that, in that muddle of what's going on in the world doesn't do any of us any good. And it just seems to empower all of that ickiness. And if we can get more people flipped over to this, this joy and peaceful mode and feeling in control, giving them tools um, to feel in control and calm, you know, people talk about that stuff and they spread the word. And so I, I think that anyways, I'm hoping with COVID that eventually that takes over <laughs> and people, we, we kind of flip the switch on, on what's going on to being collaborative and in feeling how interconnected we all are and really how similar we all are, no matter how different we appear um, on many different levels, you know, at our core, we're all human. Um, now with that song, I, if I'm not mistaken, people can go ahead and donate to Stories Love Music for $25 and then they'll actually receive the full song free. Is that correct? Is a That's right. It's a gift. Um you know, any donation size, you will, you know, a tw if you did 25, you would actually be sponsoring a caregiver through the programs, you know, that we do. So every donation is, will not only allow a caregiver to receive the program for free, but you get a additional uh, surprise gift of the Joy of Life song. Wonderful. So cool. if you go to Stories Love Music, um, there's a donate page and you will get the song um, down, you know, ready for you to download. Okay. And that's storieslovemusic.com. Um, that. That's right. Well, let's talk about the, the joy of creative engagement for caregivers, the program. What exactly does that offer people? So, oh, back in the day, Lori, when um, the pre-COVID uh, times, we were actually doing this program in person. And caregivers were actually signing up and giving themselves an entire day immersion uh, with us where we would feed them uh, meals, breakfast and lunch, and then they'd have a morning session and an afternoon session. And in the morning, they would learn about creative engagement as self-care. And then after lunch in the afternoon, they would have creative engagement as tools and caregiving. After COVID uh, became a part of our uh, world and we had to transform as many nonprofits and organizations have had to do to an online model. Um, and I will say, you know, one of the positive uh, rays of light from making that adjustment is I do feel like we've been able to reach a lot of caregivers um, and provide them this program in a way that was, um, while I would prefer that they gave themselves an entire day and went on a retreat with us. Uh, I am happy that they can even take this program in and it's condensed little modules that we do online. That being said, the material is the same. We start by defining what is creativity and what is engagement. And we we're building a house together, the caregiver and this program and every good house needs a strong foundation and the strong foundation is their self-care and their stress management so they have to actually take their caregiver hat off in the first couple of modules of our program and just be a human being and reconnect with their relationship their origin story and relationship to music 
Um, they do music meditations. We, they get a lot of time to share as a group um, their origin stories with music, whether they have cultural differences, um, family differences. They talk about how music was introduced to them, uh, what it allows them to do emotionally. So they get to do a lot of processing and identification about the power of music for themselves. And then the real gift of doing it is those magical miracle type transformations that they would love to see with the person they're caring for starts when they start to see shifts within themselves. Oh, I realized that I was on autopilot and I was processing a lot of pain, but I was not expressing it. A lot of frustration, anger, anxiety. Um, I had really checked out and disconnected from myself and the care of the person and the person I was caring for. So once they, have the experience themselves and go, oh, I'm going to start fitting music and creative engagement back into my daily routine. They're much more likely to pick it up as a tool in their caregiving. So then in our program, we, we shift and they learn the steps of how to set up a creative engagement music session with the one they care for. Because this is not about music as wallpaper, right? We all walk in the grocery store, uh, drug stores, um, you know, maybe you turn it on when you're washing dishes or cleaning clothes and music's just on in the background and that's okay. It's okay to have music there that just gives you a beat, um, gives you some inspiration maybe to fold the laundry and get it done or cook the meal or do the, the shopping. But we're talking about moving music to the foreground. So they learn how to do that, how to sit um, with the person that they, with dementia that they are caring for and how it can be this incredible doorway to that person reconnecting with them, their self and their emotional life before they receive their diagnosis. And they deepen, it deepens the relationship between caregiver and cared for because they come around music, they, they bond around music. And that may mean uh, that they talk more or just make more eye contact or they cry or they dance or they laugh, um, they move their body. We discuss in our program what may happen and how to improvise with what um, may happen. And it is just, Lori, the stories that the caregivers will come back um, in our fifth module, um, in sort of the end, I leave time in our program for them to come back and share with me the effect on themselves or the effect on the ones they're caring for. How have they shared uh, what they've learned? What do they notice the power is with themselves? And I, that's really what keeps me going um, as the executive director and as, as a facilitator is hearing how it resonates and impacts both the caregiver and, and the one cared for. Well, you know, I love that you bring people to that conscious awakening because I think we've lost that on so many levels of what impacts our lives. And when we can bring people into that, I mean, it, it just makes you look at life totally different when you, when you realize the depths that something has, uh, uh, um, has on an impact level in your life. And, and again, like I said earlier, we've just taken it for granted, but you really let them explore the beauty of that and the, the profoundness of something that's so, I think what we believe is so simple and, and we take it for granted. And so when something is simple, I think people a lot of times think, well, it can't help. It, you know, it isn't, it isn't a real fix. It, it can't really do anything. I mean, I use this every day. How, how could this now be profound? And you're letting them see how profound it's been in their life all along and how they can rev that up and really apply that. Absolutely. That is, that is really, really cool. And again, I, I think, you know, with music, with something that is, which most of us think is simple, unless they like, don't ask me to sing or play an instrument, you know, but I mean, I can, I can listen and I can enjoy music, um, but you probably don't want to hear from me. There's, you know, it it says it's simple and I can do this where so often I think we feel out of control in 
And I, and I do think in a lot of ways, and, and this is changing, but I think for years we have told, we've been told it has to be complicated. It has to be a medical model in order to fix something. And this breaks that down and says, no, it really doesn't. There's a lot of ways to bring comfort and happiness and joy into your life. Oh, yes. And, you know, in the field work we did that included institutions where we uh, saw the power of this on professional caregivers, nurses, aides, to being in field work situations with family caregivers, a husband with a wife, a, a daughter with a mother, um, they would be shocked initially mm -hmm. at the change in the energy uh, with the person. Um, where it could be at times so much of a battle and stress uh, for the one being cared for, relinquishing control, feeling uh, powerless, not feeling valued, not feeling like they have special time with the people around them. Music, sharing music, as everybody knows, when they go to a concert or uh, you, they experience together, there's that principle of entrainment, mm -hmm. right? When people are listening to music, it enters into the body, the spirit on a cellular level. We are all born right in the, in the womb. We hear the mother's heartbeat. We are connected to sound so profoundly that why would that change when we become an adult? Or why would that change if someone has a, a memory impairment issue? So when caregivers turn around and say, oh, but Ileana, you know, I'm not a professional musician, I'm not a singer, I underscore this a lot. That is not the point. The point of this is that the caregivers are what we have 40 plus million caregivers in the United States, they need to be the ones using the music, not the music therapist, not just the music therapists, not just the professional musicians. They are the ones on the front lines, in the trenches, hours, you know, long hours. As you said, this is a simple, available tool that we all forget. And that is why our program begins with remembering, remembering the impact that music has on us and saying, if it's so powerful for me, imagine what it would be for this person that I'm with and I'm caring for. And so we use tools and tips about how to pick the right music, how to set the scene. But to, I, I was you know, going to continue to say, forgetting words, singing the wrong notes, none of that means anything. Mm -hmm. When I would work with people with Alzheimer's as a singer during my field work, if I messed up notes and forgot words and I would laugh at myself because I was like, oops, and I would start just having fun with it. The person with Alzheimer's would have fun with me and they didn't seem to care at all about any of that. Mm -hmm. What they seemed to be picking up on from me was my passion and emotional connection to the music, not perfect singing. So I beg the caregivers, I say, please, please, please don't you know, don't disregard music and singing music with your person because you think you're not, you can't do it perfectly. That is missing the point. Well, you know, it's funny you bring that up because with my mom was, uh, she sang beautifully. She was in the choir. I was one that had the voice. I'll, I'll never forget. I was always singing, but I'll never forget my dad in the car going, can you just have her stop? You know, because my voice was not one that people wanted to hear, but I love the music. I love singing. Um, but I, but I learned not to do that is openly, you know, but as my, with my mom with dementia, you know, she lived with it for 30 years as it progressed, she got me to singing again with her. Cause like you said, she didn't care. She just wanted the joy of the music. And one of the things that we ended up doing, we would, um, when there was music playing, when she was able to stand and walk, we would dance. And then when she was wheelchair bound, I would dance with her in her wheelchair. And then as that got too difficult, then we would kind of do a whole hand dance. And then it got down to just a pinky dance. Um, but we were, you know, we were enjoying the music. Plus we were touching, which I think is another concept that kind of falls by the wayside when people are ill or as people age, they don't touch as much. So those connections are even more powerful. Um, 
and we have beautiful pieces of my mom singing on, on YouTube, just short clips where a musician came in and sang to my mom, thought we would do it for an hour. It lasted a half an hour. She's been gone since 2014. Eliana, I can go and be having my worst day. And all I have to do is watch a part of one of those videos and life is good. Mm. Because she is so joyful, even though she can't sing all the words, you can see her hands moving and her feet and her smile. And, you know, she's just ecstatic to be alive in those moments and feeling so connected. And you can't miss that. By, you know, if you're looking, you cannot miss that. Um, I've played that at um, conferences and stuff, and people just start tearing up, you know, with my mom giggling and watching it. Go, well, that is so powerful. You, you can't miss it. So teaching people how to set the stage to have those moments is beautiful. And when we ourselves as care partners can be in that zone, we don't come in with all the baggage that we're trying to hide, all of our angst or anger or frustration or whatever baggage we're carrying because our person with dementia can still read that. Even when we have a smile on our face, they can still read all our nonverbals. And so if we can get rid of that, the person with dementia is not gonna mirror those behaviors back to us, which a lot of times we don't even realize we're bringing them in. I mean, there's just so many benefits on so many levels. And, you know, when you can, when you can feel relaxed and, and happy and joyful, because the person you're caring for is feeling safe and comfortable and joyful. I mean, that's magic. It is, it is truly magical. What you said is, is, is very valuable, very profound. And we were very touched emotionally, both when we would see families uh, responding in memory clinics, having special moments that they thought they would never have again, mm -hmm. or nurses on a 12 hour shift that were just so burnt out, but they would find these special moments with their, um, the residents and the people that they took care of. Now, yet another benefit is that not only can you cultivate these joyful moments, but the ultimate goal with the program is to also manage those reactionary uh, behaviors, manage those reactionary moments, and ultimately, hopefully, create a climate for cooperation with care. Create that link. Because a lot of times people go, well, what does the joy of life moment have to do with cooperation with care? Well, oh, the lot. stories that... <laughs> what the stories that caregivers have shared with me now, we've been doing this since 2017. What I, the sense I get is that once they turn that page inside and go, oh, if I'm not feeling great as a caregiver and I don't process, process and express my emotions, which music can allow me to do, then I carry those unprocessed, unexpressed emotions and stress into the care and I'm checked out and I'm irritated with my person and we have no joy of life together. And it is quite dark and quite depressing. Or the opposite. They suddenly value, they do these music meditations with themselves. They create playlists for themselves to express whatever they need to express day to day that changes. And then they go, you know, uh, I can recall, I mean, there's so many great illustrative stories, but I can recall, a, you know, a nurse at a, at a long-term care facility telling us how she, bathing a resident with dementia were, were um, moments that could be quite um, moments of emotional outbursts where this person did not like the feeling of, of being, um, you know, taken to a shower and undressed and felt very vulnerable and scared when they started incorporating creative engagement in music with this resident, it was like an invitation for enjoyment. And mm -hmm. they said, suddenly, the same activity that had caused a battle kind of behavior suddenly was pleasurable. And maybe it's because she felt safe she felt invited. She was put into a good space before the activity. So we're also, I, I want people to understand that this is, 
And this is why we can't relegate music and creative engagement to these alternative therapies anymore, because they are finding that if you want cooperation with care and you don't want to battle, you have to humanize um, these exchanges, these challenging moments and be strategic and say, I wonder if music and creative engagement could strategically help me in the most challenging days, uh, challenging moments of my caregiving day. So that is what we also work on. And that is why this is so valuable in the long term. You know, it's interesting you mentioned the shower because I, when my mom was in a nursing home, I had um, bought some handheld rain showers because my mom had an issue with the, the pressure hitting her, which I didn't know until I talked with Tipa Snow. And she said, it, it's just, it scares them. It comes out of nowhere. It comes from the top. We have to start from the bottom. We need it softer. So I went and I bought all these handheld showers and the director said, well, what else would you like to see in the bathrooms? And of course I said, heated floors and heated towel bars and different colors, um, aromatherapy. And I said, in music pump in music so they can have their favorite tunes played. And, you know, it's amazing the difference that that can make. And I said, my ultimate would be to get the staff to be able to sing these songs with them, because then it, it just puts everything in a, in a different framework. But I think what you're saying, it, it makes so much sense. And I love that you use the word reaction instead of behavior. We're really good at saying they have a behavior and a behavior is a negative, go in the corner. None of us want to be told that, but we all have reactions to everything every day. Um, and a lot of times we don't even realize we're reacting. Um, you know, the role of the eyes or the, uh, you know, that we don't even know is coming out of us, but somebody else is picking up all of those things that we're doing. And a person with dementia can still pick up on all of those things. So if we can alleviate that, not only for ourselves, but for them, that's a really, really beautiful thing. Let's talk a little bit about, you know, what, what the response has been from, from caregivers. And I know that you've, you've given me a couple of clips. So let's go ahead and, and play clip one, and then we'll come back and talk about that. I have a sister, my baby sister, who has dementia. She has vascular dementia. And I talked with her husband and I asked him if he would plan uh, an old time goodies kind of party and put together a playlist and just uh, play some old songs that they used to dance to. And mm -hmm. he thought I was being completely crazy. He's a military <laughs> Uh, and then we talked about some of the songs and he decided, OK, I'll put together about three or four songs and see what happens. And then I recommended if she becomes involved, uh, then I want you to invite her to dance. And he asked me, what do you mean involved? I said to him, if she starts to sway or clap or sing along, then see if you can get her to engage differently. As it turned out, with the first song, she started to sway. And he oh. called me. So he left the phone open as he invited her to dance. And for about 20 minutes, they had a wonderful house party. And he was <laughs> excited and said that he was going to do that on a regular basis. Oh, but that was very, very fulfilling. In her dementia, she seemed to have developed resentment for him doing the kinds of things she always did. And there's mm -hmm. been this friction. Mm -hmm. So that was uh, a tender moment for him that she actually wanted to be with him and wanted to dance with him. Uh, and he was shocked that that happened. I was shocked too, because I've seen her resistance that when he's trying to make a meal and feed her, that she's really giving him serious pushback. So with clip one, um, what, are you, uh, what do you get out of hearing that response from a, from a care partner? So these, you know, these particular clips that I, I shared with you are, are from the family caregiver perspective of, um, in this particular case, her sister uh, with dementia and um, the husband, and she shared, you know, she, she took this program and shared she wanted her sister to experience some joy 
uh, you know, with her sister's husband, her, her um, brother-in-law. And I just love that she saw and that they could feel the difference as a couple um, between creating this special time together versus the mundane pedestrian activities of medication and food in which he would have a battle that, you know, she describes there could be this resistance, um, but that she was clearly, this woman's sister was clearly delighted when her husband offered her this other kind of exchange and activity of having music and dancing and how suddenly the whole family was talking about maybe having a special kind of dance party together. And I mean, let's face it, um, not only in this situation with a caregiver with someone with dementia, but with COVID and families spending more and more time together and realizing that creating special moments together that you might take for granted is really ultimately beneficial. So. I just think it was very um, powerful to hear, and that is our hope that somebody comes out like that. That woman comes out of our program and not only shares it with her in her direct community, but shares it with family and friends, and kind of passes along. And there's this ripple effect. Hey, don't forget to use music, or don't forget to use it with yourself, or don't forget to use it with others. And so we really count on that ripple effect. I love the ripple effect because I think it's so powerful in that word of mouth um, expression of endorsement. I mean, there's nothing more powerful than that. Google can argue with me on that, but I still think word of mouth and that personalized endorsement of this is this is beautiful. You need to try this um, wins hand hands down. Let's listen to clip number two and then we'll talk about that. And so um, but I'm listening to all the stories. I certainly agree that music um, changes the atmosphere and it creates a, a space where people can feel safe to express feelings that they may not even know they have. They may not even realize are, that are holding them back. Like the one you said that someone may be, feel frozen or stuck. You know, even though I'm a caregiver, I can be emotionally frozen too. I can, it's a feeling of numbness that you can have when you're a caregiver. Um, that you have to be mindful of. And we just sat quietly and listened to music. And I, I could tell that he was getting kind of emotional with the music. I mean, but he's verbal. He can talk and, and express how he feels. Um, it was just nice. We let we uh, had music playing in the house for probably about two hours that morning. We didn't turn on the television. We just sat and listened to one song after another. We turned it on YouTube. YouTube channel? and just let it keep playing. And I guess because it knows what songs I like, it just kept playing different gospel songs. And we just sat there listening to it and sometimes worshiping and sometimes just listening to it. But it was just a nice moment, just nice to be together and not feel rushed. Because even though I work from home, I tend to rush around all the time. I'm rushing out of my office to give a mess and rushing out to do this, that, and the other. But that day, or that week when we were listening to music, every day we started slowly. I scheduled all my appointments later in the day to make sure I didn't have anything planned for the morning so that we could do that. It was nice. So any comments on, on clip two here from, from this one? So, you know, in this case, the caregiver um, who took the program was um, is, the, is the wife to a husband who she cares for. And I just think she is a great reminder, what she articulates, that she had to change her approach to the day. You know, that she realized that she was rushing. You know, here it is, she has a very, you know, as a lot of caregivers do, that challenge of working, balancing their work life, checking their emails, doing work, also caring for the one that they're caring for. And she was seeing herself rushing and doing things and then, rushing in her caregiving and never being in the moment. So to me, what resonated in hearing her was that she was feeling what it felt like to start her day differently. To it, What happened on those days where they started their day together, she and her husband listening to music, as she said, not scheduling anything in the beginning of the day, 
seeing how that changed the course because she's she's wonderful in that she would she also shared in the program she was very honest about those days when she saw her own stress and locked upness and how she willfully chose to do nothing about it and how terrible that felt but she was acknowledging what got in the way on the days that she did it and the days she didn't do it that awareness is powerful because if we're asleep at the wheel we won't make any changes but at least she could acknowledge there are days when i'm i i recognize and i and i choose the right things for myself and then there are days that i don't and i don't know why but i i don't and then i and i don't feel well and now i know why well and it's beautiful that you have created this safe place where people can speak their authentic feelings and thoughts because that is really difficult to do especially in this day and age everything is so superficial and everyone feels like they're being judged and you have created a space where people can kind of come clean <laughs> there's there's nothing better than being honest with yourself but then being able to speak your truth and in doing that find ways to deal with it to do better and it, it sounds like you're not asking people to be perfect. Just here's a tool you can use. Grab it when you can. We're all going to screw up at times. And, and don't beat yourself up with it. Just know it's there next time. You know, try to make it resonate to the top so it's easier to grab a hold of. And some days that's easier than others. But we all go through that. And yet we live in this world where everything is supposed to be perfect and no one's supposed to show that they slipped up. And yet that's what makes us vulnerable. That's to me what, what makes us in a lot of ways attractive when we can be that authentic to say, you know, I, I didn't do so good. You know, to feel that safe with somebody um, to me increases the connection between the people when you feel that safe. And we don't have enough of those spots in the world anymore um, for that with the way things. Also, mm -hmm. yeah, people tend to also think that when they're working with someone with dementia that they have to force this gaiety and this happiness, like, you know, that they need to get them upbeat. Um, you know, what I have found is the kind of music that we used a lot in our, um, in our field work was songs of longing, songs of melancholy, songs of um, yearning. And people say, oh, really? You know, love songs, maybe they didn't have that love in their life anymore. And they said, why, why would that be um, a good choice? And I said, well, because we all long, we all have yearnings. Um, we all, you know, need to express sadness and melancholy. And what people didn't realize on the caregiving side was that when someone with dementia was allowed to express the, those tears and that longing inside, even if they didn't understand it, they could get to a more authentic joyfulness. Um, you know, you have to pass through uh, sometimes the longing and the sadness and the yearning to get to genuine joy. So you cannot force gaiety. So, but I, I ask caregivers to use their instincts and intuition with the person they care for. Maybe today is a day that you do need to do uplifting, inspirational music, you know, because the, your person is seeming kind of low. Um, but maybe their lowness needs to be expressed first, or maybe they're very agitated um, and very aggressive on a particular day and they need to be soothed and calmed with music. So choosing music very strategically can be very powerful to allow someone to come to a place of peace and calm, you know, and cooperation. Well, and it goes along with Naomi Files' theory of validating feelings. You know, none of them are good or bad. They just are. And like you said, we have to move through them. It's when we get stuck in one of them that, you know, we, we, uh, we have some problems typically. And that's the so caregivers you, too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And again, it's normal, but we live in this society where we're not, it, we're not allowed, we're not, or we don't feel allowed to express all of our feelings. You know, what 
feelings have, have all of a sudden become appropriate or not appropriate. And it's not the feelings, it's the reactions to the feelings that get us in trouble. And somehow that has gotten separated. And, um, and I, so I think that that's really important work that you're doing. Let's talk about the research project that you're involved with. Well, you know, I am so thankful. The, the whole development and evolution of Stories Love Music is from having wonderful mentors, a wonderful board of directors. And they have brought me um, to a place now where this past summer we were given an opportunity. Um, one of our board members, uh, Nancy uh, Rodriguez Weller, who is um, a professor of um, pharmaceutical uh, studies at University of Maryland Eastern Shore. And the research project that Stories Love Music uh, was able to participate in this last summer was that students from University of Maryland Eastern Shore um, set up a research project where I could um, lead this program, the Joy of Creative Engagement for Caregivers, for nurses at a long-term care facility. Uh, that's on the eastern shore of Maryland called Deer's Head, and where they could get this training, um, these nurses who work with uh, patients with dementia, and after they go through the program, they then had an implementation period where they used the creative engagement tools on themselves uh, so that they could handle their own stress and their own burnout on the job. They then implemented it with their patients with dementia. Um, we asked them to specifically utilize music and creative engagement in their most challenge with their most challenging uh, residents with the most challenging behavior. Um, then these students could go into the facility. We did pre and post evaluations and they could look at both the effect that the creative engagement had before and after on the emotional health and outlook of these nurses on the job who work with people at de with dementia and then also look at behavioral changes and looking at creative engagement as a non-pharmaceutical approach to challenging times we all know that there's a lot of long-term care facilities in the united states um, laws are now uh, being evolving and they are looking at the use of um, pharmaceuticals with people with dementia. They really want people in long-term care facilities to be as thoughtful as possible around um, knowing when are times to use medication in response to behavior and when could something like creative engagement and music be used instead? Well, in order to get there, we need to have research um, in these facilities. So it's very exciting that this is happening. We hope um, to very soon get the results uh, from the students at the university. And as a nonprofit, Stories Love Music is very excited to get those research um, results. But I can share that um, one of the early pieces of um, data that came in was the powerful effect it had on these nurses and professional staff, their stress management and self-care on the job. And I would think most people listening, Lori, um, including yourself and anyone, be they um, a family member who has someone that goes into a long-term care facility, wouldn't you want to think about those staff and nurses and people and aides having tools for their own stress on the job and tools to use with people instead of a pharmaceutical approach? I would think this would be uh, very um, something that most people could really relate to. So we're excited to get those results and we hope that those results will lead to even more research at more facilities so that we can create a different culture around dementia care. Um, I love that because you know, I, I don't think there's a magic bullet out there. I know everybody wants one, but when we can use social engagement um, to better ourselves, it has a ripple effect in and of itself, if we know it or not. You know, when, uh, and I mean, you can see it through um, the Alive Inside, you know, uh, movie or go visit YouTube where music just changes one person. And when it changes that one person, the whole room is changed. 
And, you know, it just, it just happens unconsciously. And that's pretty cool. And it, with the, with our healthcare field, especially, you know, we're having this, this staffing crisis on multiple levels, um, anything to help the staff be less burdened, less stress, uh, more healthy will be great. And they can use that while they're caring for others as well and, and pass that on. I, I, I just did a, a show on Tuesday and um, we were kind of talking about the need for companies, no matter how short staff they are, they really need to, in my opinion, hire somebody that is looking at how how do we, re- not, not just their normal human services and how do we retain and get staff, but how do we help them heal? How do we support them? And there are so many outside agencies like yourself, myself, many, many others that can support staff, that can support the families that won't take a lot of time in training, you know, to do this. It, it's just a matter of getting connected that will lessen the burden for their staff, make them feel more hopeful, because I think that's one of the biggest black holes out there is this lack of hope out there, but feeling connected in that, that, hey, we are working together. And I just don't see companies doing that. They're they're doing the same old, same old, and it's not enough today. You have to have the support of the facility. You know, I will, to be perfectly honest, this research project could happen because at this facility, Deer's Head, the head of nursing, the CFO, all the administrators, they supported this idea. They wanted to support their staff. So if the ones in charge value Mm -hmm. their staff and value giving them something like this, they will conquer the hurdles. There's a lot of logistical hurdles to getting 12 nurses to all attend the online Mm -hmm. training, which is easier than getting them to do it in person uh, with COVID restrictions. But again, we need these long-term care facilities, these memory facilities, these senior homes to value this kind of work and programs for their staff, because then they will move mountains to make it happen And then, so we hope the results of this research will say, oh, somebody listening will go, oh, this facility had this happen. Perhaps we need to look into this. Perhaps we need to adopt these things because it makes sense to me. Don't you want to um, keep your staff healthy, happy, and keep them going? Exactly. Exactly. I totally agree with you. Well, this has just been a brilliant conversation. I I love the work that you're doing uh, with Stories Love Music. Again, go to storieslovemusic.com. You can make a donation, you know, $25 or more will get you the song, The Joy of Life. And you can also sign up for The Joy of Creative Engagement and spread the word. It's free. So let's get as many people signed up for this as possible. Actually starting on um, February 1st. So anybody listening, the wonderful thing, it's free and it's online. So if you are a family caregiver or a professional caregiver, you can do this from your office at work. You can do this from home. The first session starts um, February 1st at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. So if they go to storieslovemusic.com, they can register and get all the info. And this would be a great thing for human resources to know about as well for their employees that are on the the care journey to say, you know what, you can take this time off during work and you can participate in this. You know, there's just so many ways to work together to, to help families out and to make the employment journey and the caring journey a better one for all. So again, go visit storieslovemusic.com. And Ileana, thank you so much for the, for the work that you're doing. Really appreciate your time with us today. Oh, thank you so much, Lori. It was a lot of fun speaking with you. Great. For our listeners, please like, click, and share. Spread the word. You know, you got nothing to lose. It's going to take you a couple of seconds, but help somebody else out by passing along this information. Thanks everyone. We'll talk soon.